So this video is for uh, the first day, first lesson for Unit 2, Chapter 24 in our textbook from Gene Coley. And this unit is all about interference. And like we did with the uh, last unit, with Unit 1, we're going to spend uh, the first day actually just getting ready, looking at all of the little pieces of essential knowledge you need to have in order to have some success looking at interference. So some of this stuff is review. Uh, from Physics 11, sometimes we've forgotten it, so it's probably be worth going over. And a little bit of it is actually from the last unit. Uh, in fact, these notes right off the start are from the last unit. This was the first couple of pages from the last unit. And in the last unit, we were talking about the ray model, where we imagine the photons following these little trajectories that we would call rays. And that were great when we were working with large lenses, but it's not going to work when we send light through narrow little openings. And that's when we're going to notice that light actually is a wave and it has all of the wave characteristics to it. So this wave model, yeah, this is going to be for interference questions. And that's what this whole chapter is about. Let's see if I can spell that correctly. There we go. Uh, that ray model, that, that worked better for lenses. Okay, so the deciding factor, how do you know whether you're going to be looking at the wave model or the particle model? It's all about the size of the of the element, the thing that the light is going to be um, obstructed or bent by. If it's a nice big lens or a big opening in a piece of paper, then we're going to go with the ray model. But if it's small, then we're going to go with the wave model. So in this chapter that we're about to do, where we use the wave model, it's going to be because the size of the openings that we're going to send the light through, they're going to be very tiny. They're down near the wavelength of light or smaller. And that's when we're going to see this wave effect to it. Uh, if the thing that you're sending the light towards, the element is a you know, piece of paper with an opening in it that's really big, much, much bigger than the wavelength of light, um, or if it's going towards a big lens, if it's some big obstruction, or big element, then that's when you would use the ray model. So we're transitioning, and we're going to use this wave model as we go through our work. Now, like I was saying, this first day is actually just kind of getting ready to talk about the various aspects of interference. So we're going to go over some, some slightly older material for dealing with waves. Uh, the very first thing is the wave equation. Um, here's kind of a simplified non-calculus version of it. it talks about the speed at which a wave will travel like maybe down a slinky and that speed is actually equal to the wavelength how far it is from one crest to the next crest in the slinky multiplied by the frequency of those waves as they travel down the down the slinky and so let's just kind of highlight those various items here right so f that's the frequency that's how many cycles it'll do per second we just measure that in hertz one hertz is one cycle per second. This lambda, this Greek letter, it's kind of weird looking Y. This is the wavelength. And again, a little spelling mix up there. There we go. We're going to measure that in meters typically. And then our velocity, how fast the wave travels through the medium, that'll be in meters per second. Now in this chapter, we will often use light or sound for demos just based on whichever one offers the best looking demo or the best experience demo. And so you'll have two very, very different velocities and two totally different types of waves. Uh, for light waves, which is like waves of electric field, the velocity is uh, it's used so often that it often gets its own little letter here. So the velocity is equal to C. And in air, it's roughly the same as it is in a vacuum around 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. But for sound waves traveling in a classroom, they're much, much slower. It's a totally different kind of wave. It's a mechanical like push-pull of, of um, air molecules all being compressed, and it's 343 meters per second at around the room temperature that we would like to actually go and sit in. Okay, next page again. Th these are just six pieces of essential knowledge you need in order to have some good success going through an interference unit. Uh, waves are interesting because they have kind of two different aspects to them, two different domains to them. They travel through both time, meaning that if you were to watch whatever it is that's waving like a slinky a split second later, it looks different. Things are in different positions, but it also travels through space. So at any given moment, if you were to take a picture of a slinky with a wave going down it and then compare pictures, 
um, from like just compare different spots on one picture from like hey this spot on the slinky or a spot a little bit to the side you'll notice that different places on the slinky are at different positions and then that will change in time uh, so that's interesting it has to change in both time and space to truly be a wave now we like to categorize waves based on which way they're wiggling uh, some waves are what we call transverse okay that sounds overly technical let's just go nice and simple here why don't we just say hey they they wiggle whatever it is that's wiggling wiggles from side to side compared to the actual velocity direction for the wave uh, if you're a geophysicist looking at earthquakes you might say oh yeah those are those are s waves and for them the s stands for secondary because they actually get there a little bit later than these other waves fancy name here they're called longitudinal And so a longitudinal wave is a push-pull wave. And if you were a geophysicist, you might say, oh yeah, that's a P wave. So I've just pulled up here a little graphic that I often show in Physics 11, just to show the difference between the two kinds of waves. So imagine uh, this little picture here of some waves like like a red wave and a blue wave imagine those are kind of like slinky coils right i know they look like a whole bunch of ping pong balls but imagine that's a slinky and you can see here that the slinky coils are all kind of scrunched together but then here they're stretched out and then here they're scrunched together and this scrunchiness could actually move as a wave perhaps to the right or to the left and that would be a push pull wave a longitudinal wave a p wave Whereas if the slinky undulates this way, then we would say, oh, well, that's, um, that's going to be a side to side. That's actually a transverse wave. That's an S wave. So I guess the, the key difference is there, if you're trying to sort this out, you have to look at the velocity and then ask yourself, well, how, how does the direction of the wiggling compare to the velocity? So for both of these pictures, the, the wave might actually be moving in this direction. That could be the velocity. But if you were to watch an individual coil in a slinky here, that wiggling of the slinky coil is in the same direction as the velocity, whereas here the, the wiggling of the slinky coil is perpendicular to the direction of the velocity. So that's the difference between the, the longitudinal, where it lines up with it, and then the transverse, the side to side waves. Okay, so I'm just going to get this out of the way here. Should be able to do that pretty quick. One second. There we go. Oops, took away a little too much. Try that again. All right, we're ready to go. Okay, so um, different waves that we're going to work with. Again, we'll work with whichever wave is going to offer us the best demo. Uh, light waves, just so that you know, they're actually waves of electric field, what we just sometimes call E field and they are transverse. So the electric fields are waggling, if you wish, sideways compared to the actual motion of the wave. So the, the velocity in this picture would be this way. If this was uh, the last chapter, we would say, oh, there's the ray. That's the way the light's actually going to go. And you can actually see this wiggling of electric fields coming out of the laser. Not really to scale, but you can see which way it's actually wiggling. Um, if we were to put a, um, a person there, we could have a little observer observing these electric field waves pass by them, right? That's why I've just got that dotted line. So you can watch those crests and troughs kind of make their way to the right while that little person is sitting there. Uh, very often in this chapter, it's convenient to kind of mark the peak of a wave and kind of watch that peak of the wave travel through space and kind of loosely said we could say oh yeah that's that's a wave front okay some nice little recognizable landmark on the wave we can watch that progress kind of like you're up on the top of a cliff watching the waves move on a lake and you can see the peaks of the waves like as lines moving across the lake okay so that's a, tr a transverse wave it's going to be a side to side wave it's a wave of electric field uh, sound waves are completely different. Like they're a totally different kind of thing that's waving. They're actually just an, an air molecule compression, right? So they're they're just let's call it molecule compression. This is not super critical. 
but my point is it has nothing to do with electric fields. It's a completely different kind of wave. It happens, it happens to actually be a longitudinal wave. So it's a push-pull wave, right? A P wave. And the, the way it works is if you had a speaker playing some music, that speaker diaphragm pushes forward and it causes this scrunchiness of the air where the air is all compressed together and the pressure is going to go up. And then that pressure, that high pressure, causes the molecules just to the right to push forward. And then they're going to have this scrunchiness area just move to the right. So we're going to have the same kind of issue as we saw with light in the sense that there is some velocity to it, right? The velocity will be this way. And if you wanted to, if you wanted to, you could watch one little ripple of scrunchiness move across the room, right? That would be right here. So that's the same ripple moving across the room. Now, don't get me wrong. If you were to watch one individual little air molecule, like maybe that one right there, it is not going to get to that person's eardrum, not because of the sound. It's actually just going to waggle, you know, non-technical term, it's going to wiggle left and right, right? And we'll see that wiggling move as a wavefront from the speaker towards the person. Uh, but it'll, it'll often be very, very handy just to watch this wavefront move from the speaker towards the person. You know, for both these pictures, we could go and, and measure the wavelength if we wanted to, right? We could grab a ruler and say, oh, okay, how far is it from there to there, right? That would be the wavelength. Or with the laser beam, you know, you could measure from, oh, let's say from, find a convenient spot here, maybe from here to there, right? Crest to crest, that could be a wavelength. Now, for sound waves, at some point, it just becomes really tedious trying to draw all these little dots for all the air molecules just to try to show where the ripples are. So instead, we offer this metaphorical drawing, uh, but that's really all this is. Okay, So if people are actually saying, oh yeah, well, here's my little sound wave, um, and they show it like this, this is just a drawing, it's just a metaphor, and the idea is you can see that at this peak on the little metaphorical graph, that's where the air molecules are all scrunched. So it's just a record of scrunchiness, right? Of the pressure, right? The squished down nature of the sound of the air molecules as you look across the room. But don't get the impression just because of that drawing that there's actually some wiggling to the side, right? In this case, up or down when the velocity goes off to the right. Um, it's actually a wiggling of air molecules left and right, but sometimes this drawing can just actually be helpful in order to figure out what's going on. Okay, more little bits of essential knowledge that will help you out as we go through our interference chapter. So we're not even looking at the interference yet, um, but just so you know, light waves do not need a material. Well, okay, a fancy name for that, the material that stuff goes through, that waves go through, is the medium. So they don't need a medium to travel through. They can actually even go through the emptiness of space, the vacuum of space from the sun to the earth. There's nothing needed there between the sun and the earth in order for these electric fields to travel. Sound is different. That mechanical push-pull of the air molecules, it needs something to squish. It might be water that's being squished to higher pressures, or it might actually be concrete. Uh, but sound waves do need material to travel through. They need a medium. So you can't hear people screaming in space, right? There has to be something, some sort of air or something for the sound to travel through. Okay, what are we up to? That was the second little piece of essential knowledge, getting ready for this chapter. All right, let's move on. So number three, what happens when waves on a slinky, waves on a guitar string, waves in a lake, sound waves traveling across the room, light waves traveling across the room, all, all those situations, what happens when they meet, right? When they're trying to go to the same place in space. So you can see in this little picture here, we've actually got this tiny little small wave right here, and it's heading with some velocity towards this big wave, right? Kind of curious to see what happens. Well, this whole issue of what happens when they do this, we call this business superposition. And it's really a two-part deal. 
So for one thing, the waves, they do not collide. It's not like cars, you know, where you might get a little tiny Volkswagen bug bouncing off of a dump truck. That's not going to happen here. The waves do not collide. They actually pass through each other, right? But when they do pass through, so here you can see the small one is there, and here it is, and it's on top in that picture there, and then it keeps on going. So at the end, yeah, here's the small one. It never bounced off the big one. But there is this issue where for a brief moment, they're going to be in one place in space. And so now we're almost getting to the point where we can start talking about interference. And so their, their amplitudes briefly add up. And you can see in the first picture, the small and the big wave, we're both trying to waggle this string up and you get this really big wiggle right there in the middle. But in the second picture, they were actually trying to wiggle it in different directions. The little one's trying to wiggle it up, the big one's trying to wiggle it down. And during that brief moment when they're on top of each other, they're gonna fight each other. It looks like the big one wins by a little bit. So they kind of add up in like a vector sense. And that leads us into the next part. So if two waves meet, when they pass that same point in space, okay, it's actually gonna depend on whether they're both trying to go the same way or not. Are they both trying to go up? Or are they both trying to go down on the slinky? Or if it's sound coming from a speaker, are they both trying to push? Or are they both trying to pull? There's one trying to push or pull. And the, the nice, easy way to talk about that in, in physics is we talk about the phase difference. So phase difference, that little phrase, just means we're going to be talking about whether or not these waves are synchronized or not. Is there a difference in timing between the pushes and the pulls for both these sources or between the ups and the downs? So it's actually their, their coordination, their phasing, their phase difference that will determine the type of interference. So imagine you've got this story here with a couple of speakers and I'm just going to go and say, oh yeah, yeah, let's go and drop in a little person right here and they're going to listen to the music. But before I do, let's make sure I clarify that this red wiggle and this blue wiggle, those are just metaphors, right? Like, let's go back a page just for a second. You know, really sound is this push-pull, this wiggling forward and backward of air molecules. I should be drawing a billion little dots, uh, but that's just hard to do. So instead of drawing a whole bunch of little dots, I'm just drawing that instead. It's just faster than me trying to draw all the little dots. Okay, so with that said, let's go back and look at this picture. So the blue speaker is sending out this wave of pushes and pulls, and it looks like right at this moment, we've got a push, right? The top of this, the top of this crest in this little metaphorical drawing. And so that tells me, oh yeah, at this very instant, maybe this, this wave is actually traveling this way, right? There's some velocity. But at this very instant, we're actually seeing a peak in the graph. So the air is very squished by that person. Now this other speaker farther back seems to be playing the exact same frequency. The wavelengths are the same, um, but it's a little bit farther away. And you might think, oh, that's going to make it quiet. Well, not necessarily. You have to very carefully look and see how many waves have actually snuck in during that space between the two. And so it looks like there's time for one wave and then time for a second wave. There's exactly two wavelengths in there. And I don't care whether it's two or three or four or five. It's not about whether it's an even number. It's about whether it's a whole number. If you're out by a whole number, then it looks like right at this instant, the, the speaker with a little marking in red is also doing a push. That's going to create a very impressive squishing of the air molecules there. And we would say in physics that, oh, those speakers, their, their timing is right on, on top of each other. And we would use the phrase, oh, yeah those wave sources are in phase where that person is they're cooperating together and when things are in phase we would say that the kind of interference that they do is constructive interference it's going to cooperate when you have constructive interference you should expect whatever that wave to uh, to be being it might be sound it might be light it might be like a 
lake wave, you should expect it to be very impressive. So if it's a sound experiment, you should expect it to be very loud. If it's a light experiment, expect that place to be very bright. Or if it's an ocean, then expect that spot on the ocean to be very wavy. It'll be bouncing up and down if you're in a little rubber dinghy. Now this next picture down below, it looks like the spacing is different. Looking at the waves, just metaphorically drawn with this red wiggle, we've got one full wavelength, uh oh, and then a half, just a crest with no trough before we're in line with the blue speaker. And you can see that if you had a person here, as those waves, those compression waves, travel this way with some velocity, as that wiggle pattern moves, you're always going to have the two speakers fighting. Right when the blue speaker is trying to create a push, the red one's going to try to create a pull, and then vice versa, just a split second later. And those are going to cancel each other out. So you're going to end up with what we call destructive interference. And if this was a sound experiment, it would be very quiet. You might not hear anything at all. If it was a light experiment, it'll actually be very dark at that spot in space. Or if this is an ocean, you'd actually find it to be very calm in that spot in the ocean. Now, another representation that teachers like to draw for this is this little deal with concentric circles. So you have to imagine that what you've got here are a couple of speakers just sound speakers, All right? Sitting right here and right there, just kicking out some sound. And then these rings are actually the ripples of sound that are actually making their way out from the speakers. And if you were to catch a spot where the ripples line up, maybe I'll put those in green, like here, or here, or here, or here, or there, you've actually got like crests lining up with crests, and that's going to be very, very loud also here and here, right? So that would be very, very impressive, super loud wherever I've drawn something in green because the, the waves are lining up in phase. But you could find quiet spots as well, right? So a quiet spot would be a place where a crest lines up with a trough, like there and there and there, or maybe here. Right? Those would all be very quiet places where they're not agreeing with each other. It's just another way that teachers like to draw that. So it's just kind of useful to, to be aware of that. Okay, let's move on and see what we've got left here. Just a few more things to be ready to do this interference chapter. Next thing we have to talk about is what happens to velocity, wavelength, and frequency when some sort of wave goes to a place that is a different medium. Maybe, maybe you've got a sound wave going from air to water, or a light wave maybe going from air to glass. In fact, let's, let's talk about that. Let's say you've got air here, and maybe glass here, which is a little bit slower. It has an index of refraction that's above one. So a little slower for this section. Now I'm just drawing these lines and I got to tell you why it's because I'm lazy, right? These lines are supposed to represent the wave fronts. And at, that's because I don't want to try to draw the picture of like the ocean waves traveling across this, this lake, right? That's what's happening though, is it's traveling across this lake of air from left to right. And if I was to try to draw that in, oh, it would kind of look kind of like this, like here's the electric field wave down and up and down and, and all along here. So everywhere where that black line is, is kind of the peak perhaps of an electric field wave that's traveling to the right. Okay, so the velocity will be off towards that glass. Okay, so in comes my electric field. And as it comes in, there's a certain wavelength in this story, right? So right here, I could measure from the peak of one wave to the peak of the next. Maybe I'll call that wavelength one, right? Because all out here, this is like trial one, part one in the story. And then over here in the glass could be trial two. And it's going to be moving along with some velocity, right? So there'll be some velocity this way. And then we're going to go into the glass. Now, ultimately, 
we're going to go down here and take a look at this formula, the wave equation, v is equal to lambda f. And we need to talk about, of those three things, how do they change when you go into this slower material? Well, one of the things I know for sure, if you're going to tell me that it's a slower material, is that the velocity is going to drop. So comparing trial 2 to trial 1, we're going to see a drop in the velocity. So that left-hand side of the equation is going to get tinier. Well, how does the right-hand side get tinier? What's actually going to change there? And it turns out it's not the frequency that changes, but instead the wave fronts actually bunch up. So if you were to watch the wave fronts in here, you would actually see that they're closer together. But the rate at which they're going by you, if you were just to be there and observe them, that rate, that frequency and period, that would not actually change. Okay, but we'll definitely see a smaller wavelength in here. So I'm just going to measure that this way and say, yeah, there's wavelength 2. And it is going to be different. It's going to be smaller. And so will this velocity, right? Velocity 2. There is a really, really cool metaphor or analogy that physicists like to use. It's great. It's, it, it's like a marching band. So imagine these lines, these wave fronts, are actually the various rows of musicians in a marching band. And they're marching through town with some velocity, right? Maybe this first row here is all of the flutes, and then you've got, I don't know, the trombones, and then behind them could be the trumpets back here. And they're marching their way through town. And then all of a sudden they get to one section of town that's slower. Maybe there's like a whole bunch of, I don't know, mud on the street. And their, their pacing is just a little bit slower as they walk. And then you ask the question, well, what would it look like with this marching band? And the answer is the rows would bunch up while they're in the glass. And you'd see that the flutes and the trombones get really close together. And the trombones and the trumpets get really close together. Until, of course, they leave the glass, then they would spread back out again. But the actual pace of rows of musicians going by you, that wouldn't change at all. And so things that remain the same, well, you can put a big check mark by the frequency, but the wavelength would drop when you go into that slower material. So things that remain the same, um, let's go with F for frequency. Sometimes people would rather talk about its reciprocal, the period. Okay, that won't change either. But what does change? The velocity. and the wavelength. Okay, number six. Here's a word that we have not talked about at all in Physics 11. In fact, um, up until this point, I would have just denied that it's the truth, right? But now it's the time to fix that lie and tell you that what we first learned for just how light bends when it goes into a piece of glass was a little bit naive in the sense that the index of refraction is not the same for every color. It varies slightly. So let's put a little definition in here. Dispersion is all about that issue that for most materials, except the most expensive ones, for most materials, they have these indices of refraction, right? Those ends, they have ends that vary not by a lot, okay, so they, oops, they vary just slightly with color. So you'll actually find a, a graph in our textbook where it says, okay, for this glass you're going to work with, here's the, a little graph of what the index is based on the wavelength of the color that you're looking at. Um, and so, for example, just to give you an idea of how much it might change, the index of refraction for a chunk of glass for red down at that end of the story might be 1.513. But if you do some really, really careful measurements, you might find that when you're way up at the other end, maybe the index for violet might be 1.521. You know, so to a couple sig figs, we could just say, oh yeah, the index of the glass is 1.5. And you wouldn't be lying but it is slightly different for each color. And so each color does a slightly different amount of bending. And if it's not a window, if it's a prism, by the time it does that double bend, you could actually get these colors starting to separate. Kind of like that Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon album cover, uh, where the reds don't do an overall bend as much as those violets do, right? And that issue for why that happens, it's because they don't all have the same index. So their Snell's Law story is a little bit different for each one. And that issue is just called dispersion.
Okay, we're going to do one more page. This is just for fun. No stress here. It does often stress students out because they're like, oh my gosh, how am I going to draw this? It's so hard. Um, it's just a neat thing to look at. Uh, there, there was this physicist by the name of Huygen who came up with a neat way of figuring out where the waves would go, what the pattern would look like farther down the road. Uh, so if I go back to the marching band idea, I can actually show you how Huygen's idea would work. So I can see all the different rows of the band moving down through town, and I might wonder, well, where's the next wavefront going to be? What's it going to look like? And he said, well, imagine there are like a whole bunch of musicians out here, right? And they're actually playing their instruments. So you draw these little little dots, and they're going to be now sources of waves. So you just put some evenly spaced dots on the last wavefront, and you imagine it's kind of like they're they're little Huygen radiators, little singers, like choir members, and they're going to be belting out some music. And here comes a ripple of sound from that one, maybe a ripple of sound from that one, and a little ripple of sound coming off from that one, and a ripple of sound coming off from that one. And here's what I noticed. Okay, my spacing wasn't perfect, but it's pretty close. I'm going to now look for all of these little places where these lines from the Huygen radiators are all interfering nicely with each other in a nice positive way, like line on top of line. And I just connect all of these points up, right? So I could go, oh, there, there's where the next wavefront's gonna go, right? And then that would show you, oh yeah, okay. You know, so the velocity of this wave is this way. And we call those little dots that you draw Huygen radiators. And it just shows you where the next wavefront's gonna go. And so all these black lines here, these are all various wavefronts, including this orange one that we just found. Huygens' idea is actually a neat way to show what happens when waves go through a single opening of different sizes. So imagine you've got a, a big wide single opening or a narrow little one. And it's, it's now perfectly fair for you to say, well, by, by whose judgment? How do you know whether it's wide or not? Well, you actually have to look at the wavelengths that are heading towards it. So I can see these little ripples in this tank of water, and I can see how tight they are together, right? So that's the that's the wavelength in there. Doesn't look like that wavelength is very big, right? It's roughly that big for the wavelength for these waves. And now what we're gonna do is start comparing the size of this opening to that wavelength. And it looks like this upper picture's got a pretty big opening compared to the wavelength. Whereas the one down here has got a pretty small opening. It's getting, you know, down around the size of the wavelength. And so here's what you find. If you actually go and draw some little Huygen radiators along here, and you can get quite a few in here, and you can see the picture over on your left, right? If you actually draw them and then connect the lines up, you can see that it does this, it does this pretty focused beam. We would actually maybe use the word collimated, right? It, yeah, it spreads out just the touch on the edge but not much right it's pretty beam like as it comes out of there and so you're going to get this pattern that's going to be pretty darn straight now you have to be a little open-minded here you can't you can't like get too hung up on the math this is just a rule of thumb but you're going to get a straight beam if the opening size is much much bigger than the wavelength you know, and then you might ask, well, how much is much, much bigger? I don't know, a lot bigger. Then you're going to see more of a straight path. But as you narrow that opening, you can't fit as many little Huygen radiators in the hole. And what you notice is the pattern changes. It just kind of morphs. It's this slow shift into a pattern that's actually much more fan-like, where it actually spreads out like this. Now, we're going to see on a later day that there's actually some spots in the fan that are missing, but it definitely spreads out. So you're going to get some spreading in your story. And now the question is, well, when does that happen? You know, when that opening gets around the size of the wavelength or less. So, you know, somewhere like I'm just going to say like less than or equal to roughly speaking than the wavelength. Uh, but that is just a guide. So you might find that, hey, the opening was twice as big as, as the wavelength and I'm still seeing some spreading. Yeah, I know. But it's just that if the opening is, you know, 500 times as big as the wavelength, you might not see any spreading. But if it's maybe 10 times smaller than the wavelength, you're going to get a lot of spreading. And it's kind of cool that you can get there just by drawing these little Huygen dots, these little Huygen singers, these little Huygen radiators. We'll actually use that 
as we start to move into the interference section next day to look at what happens when some waves come up to a couple of openings. We'll say, oh, well, we can put a little Huygens radiator there and a little Huygens radiator there. We can actually see what happens when they start singing. And this one says, well, I'm going to fan out some waves all across the room like this, nice and wide, because the opening's pretty narrow. And this other one says, oh, yeah, well, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to fan out my wave energy all across the room, too. And what you can see now is that if we were to go and put an observer somewhere around here, they're going to be experiencing waves from multiple places. And that's what this whole chapter is about. This last picture, I just thought this was cool, so I grabbed this picture from the internet. It actually explains Snell's law, which we did for rays, right? We said, oh, well, n sine theta on one side of the boundary is equal to n sine theta. You know, and that's how light bends, right, as it goes from one material to another. And so back in the last chapter, we would have been drawing rays and measuring their angle compared to the normal, right? So there's a ray on the way in, and here's the ray on the way out as it does its little bend. Looks to me like this must be some slower material here and then some faster material there. And the cool thing is you can actually metaphorically imagine what's going on with that bending by thinking about a marching band with its musicians. And the rule is, you know, the band director says to you, flutes, you must stay together. You should always be able to look over and see the other flautist who's beside you. And at some point, this one musician right there hits the slower area and they start to slow down, but their friends are not allowed to leave them. And what ends up happening is they end up kind of pulling the whole band around the corner until eventually everybody is walking slow. But by then they've actually done a nice little twist. So this Huygen radiator business, you know, where you think of little marching band members who are singing, um, it's actually cool because it explains the, the bending from Snell's Law as well. So that's, that's it. That's what we needed to know just to be ready to go for the chapter. And then on the next lesson, which is actually going to be a lot shorter in terms of paper we use, uh, we are going to start to look at how the interference game actually works.